To assess the implication of Awlaki's killing, we turn to Brian Fishman, a fellow at the New America Foundation and the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Juan Carlos Zarate was Deputy National Security Advisor for Counterterrorism in the Bush administration and is now a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome. How important is the killing of Awlaki and how significant a figure was he, Juan? Um, I think Al-Laki grew in significance over time. Uh, he became a figure in the Al-Qaeda network, known as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, there in Yemen. Uh, he was an operational figure. He began uh, to play a more instrumental role in some of the external plots and the external network that was targeting the United States. We know he had a hand in the December 25th failed underwear bomber uh, plot, the failed package plot, uh, and had started to even toy with the use of poisons. And so operationally, he became more and more important. But I think even more significantly, Ray, is the fact that he played a key propagandist role, a kind of a Pied Piper for Western ears, uh, in a way that translated al-Qaeda's narrative and uh, inspired individuals to not only come and fight in places like Yemen, but to potentially fight fellow citizens uh, in their own homeland. And so his removal is an important step in terms of going after the network, uh, diminishing al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula's propaganda reach, uh, and I think uh, a significant step as demonstrated by the amount of attention the administration gave it today. Brian Fishman, is he more of an operational character, as Juan calls him, or of an ideologue to you? Well, I think that he certainly has become more of an operational character, as Juan was saying, but I think that his ideological and intellectual influence is still paramount. It was his ability to communicate in English, to an English-speaking audience in the West that really differentiated him from other al-Qaeda figures. And I think that uh, he'll be hard to replace in that regard. I mean, I mean there are simply not that many people uh, at a senior level in al-Qaeda that have a profile like his, born in the United States, a U.S. citizen. And what al-Laki was able to do is say, this is why I turned on my country. And in doing so, he was trying to lay out a pathway for other people to follow. And I, and I don't think that al-Qaeda will be able to replace that soon. Internet chat rooms, a bulletin board, a blog post, uh, sending videos of himself as attachments to emails, a new kind of al-Qaeda figure? Well, no. I mean, al-Qaeda has been doing those sorts of things. They were doing that in the past. And, and there are many elements of al-Qaeda that are still doing those sorts of things. But most of that content is produced in Arabic. Some of it's produced in Urdu, other in German, Turkish, French many different languages, but it was Al-Laki that was doing this in English. And so it was Al-Laki that was speaking to Americans, and it was Al-Laki that was speaking to uh, Brits, for example. And that's why he was different. Um, and it's that, that sort of personal story that gave him power and the ability to bring people into the movement, because there were things that he lacked. He lacked, for example, battlefield experience. He was not a commander. He didn't have the historical experience in Afghanistan and the personal trust with the very senior uh, central al-Qaeda figures. So he was not a, a bin Laden-level figure, but he was somebody that was able to communicate with Western Muslims in a very unique sort of way. But while bin Laden was holed up in Abbottabad, and as you describe him, Juan, he was becoming more active, was he in a way even more dangerous than Osama bin Laden? In some ways, I, I still think bin Laden served a, a key role as the central figure, the central strategist for al-Qaeda in the broader network. But uh, more and more, you heard American officials talking about the danger rising from Yemen, this affiliate in Yemen, and in particular, Anwar al role in it. I think Brian's right. I think his, his main attraction and main uh, asset for the, the broader network was his ability to attract Western ears. And I think importantly to keep in mind that he and, and a couple of others within the, the group in al-Qaeda had begun to uh, examine the field to see that what could be most effective was not just big-scale attacks of the kind that we've seen in the past from al-Qaeda, but to inspire individuals to attack the United States and others in small ways, to uh, do what they called an Operation Hemorrhage, to kill with a thousand cuts. Uh, and so that started to be a way that uh, Alaki was reshaping the strategic battle space. And I think that's important to keep in mind because you've now removed somebody who had started to redirect the strategy of al-Qaeda. Unfortunately, I think it's infected now the ideology itself and it and won't go away now that he's gone. But uh, he was very important in that regard to help to reshift that narrative and that strategy for al-Qaeda. Now, right after his death, American officials have started to call him the chief of external operations for al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Is that sort of a 
post-mortem promotion to, to bulk up who we got on the battlefield, or was he really that? Yeah, well, I, I think that's the, this is really the first time that I've heard him have that title. But I do think that there is increasing evidence, and certainly the administration is asserting that there's a lot of evidence, that he was, as Juan was saying, involved in these operational plots. And I think that's what, what, what officials are trying to, to underline, and I think that's valid. Um, but I think it's important to understand that he was not the most senior figure in al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. AQAP will go on. Nasr al-Wuhayshi is the sort of supreme leader, the emir of that organization, and uh, it's not going anywhere. So while I think the, the death of Anwar al-Awlaki does, uh, it, it makes AQAP more one-dimensional in a way. I'm off to see a football game, so I'm thinking this is like taking away AQAP's passing game. They can't reach out. Uh, directly, as directly to Americans uh, in the West, but they are still going to have the capability, they're still going to have the leadership to plan an, or attacks like the package bomb, like the Abdul Muttalib would be attack uh, over Detroit two Christmases ago. When uh, Anwar al Awlaki was the first American citizen to be the subject of a CIA kill or capture order, and now that he's been killed, a lot more attention is being focused on the nature of his death, without charge, without indictment, obviously without trial. Is this a problem? Well, I think it's something this, the administration is clearly sensitive to, and it, it, it explains in part why they are describing him so ardently as the chief uh, external operations chief. Uh, the administration uh, is going to great pains to explain his operational role, the, the, the fact that he was engaged in ongoing activity. All of that is a way of framing this uh, in terms of imminent danger to the United States that then gives the U.S. credibility under international law and under our own laws to take self-defensive measures and to take kinetic activities against an individual, even if that individual is an American citizen. But we've known this issue has been out there. The ACLU had challenged via Alaki's father the alleged targeting of Alaki, a case they lost at the lower court level in, in federal court. Um, and so this issue of what the government can do with respect to an individual, an American citizen, who has joined al-Qaeda, who is clearly trying to plot against the United States, what level of uh, kinetic activity, what level of force can they use without some level of due process? That's clearly something the administration is very sensitive about. Brian, was it legal? Well, I'm not a Supreme Court justice, but I've got real concerns about it because it sets a precedent, and I simply don't understand the criteria by which the decision was made that, Al that Anwar al laki could be killed. Uh, what does an American citizen have to do to fall into that category? The second concern I have, and why I think that a judicial process of some kind would have been useful here, is that it would have been an opportunity for the U.S. government to lay out all the things that Anwar al-Awlaki has done. He may be dead, but his, his vision and his message is not. And what I think would have been useful is to have a judicial process where you get to talk about the fact that he solicited prostitutes. You get to talk about the fact that he was sort of a hypocrite in and of himself. And, uh, and because of that, uh, the fact that we weren't able to do those things, we didn't do those things, I think we've missed an opportunity to, to do more than just kill him, but to describe credit the ideas that he pushed for years. Brian Fishman, Juan Carlos Zarate. Gentlemen, thank you both. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.